Sarah, a 29-year-old journalist, was always looking for materials that could attract the attention of the audience. She specialized in crime reporting, but her career stalled. Since the news world took over social media, her investigations have stopped generating ratings. The editorial office had only one goal, find something shocking, something that no one has heard of yet. Sarah heard about a series of disappearances in a small town. Over the past year, more than 20 people have disappeared there, most of them young men and women. The police did not give any comments, and local residents avoided any conversations on the subject. For Sarah, it was an opportunity that could bring her back to the top stories. She arrived in this town late in the evening. The main street was lit only by a few dim lanterns, and most of the buildings looked abandoned. At a local diner, Sarah began asking the owner about what was going on. The man, looking around nervously, said that all the disappearances took place in one area, the old industrial zone. This part of the city has been deserted for a long time. After the closure of the factory, many residents moved away, leaving the houses empty. But that's where all the missing people were last seen. Sarah decided to go there despite the warnings. The next day, she went to the industrial area. There was a strange sense of isolation here. Abandoned buildings, faded graffiti on the walls and broken windows created a gloomy picture. Sarah took out her camera and started taking pictures. In one of the buildings, footprints on the floor caught her attention. They were fresh, dirty shoe prints leading to the stairs. She decided to follow them. She found a strange room on the second floor. There were pictures of young people on the walls, and in the center was an old table. There were personal items on the table. Watches, phones, and even documents. Sarah started filming everything on camera. Her heart was pounding, but she knew she had stumbled upon something important. Suddenly, she heard footsteps. Quickly hiding behind a shelf, she saw two men enter the room. Both were dressed in dark clothes, and their faces were hidden by hoods. One of them opened a large bag and poured its contents onto the table. These were things similar to those that were already lying here. Three more, one of them said. We don't have much time. The police are already interested, another replied. Sarah could barely hold her breath. She was trying to record what was happening on camera unnoticed. When the men left, she quietly got out of her hiding place and hurried away. Sarah returned to her rented apartment to watch the recorded video. Everything was visible on the frames. Photos on the walls, things of missing people, conversations of men. Her hands were shaking. It was an incredible investigation that could have become a sensation. The next day, she decided to return to the industrial area to find more evidence. In one of the buildings, she found an old room resembling a torture chamber. There were stains on the floor that looked like blood, and the walls were painted with strange symbols and inscriptions. There was a folder with documents on the table, which mentioned the names of the missing people. Sarah began to feel like she was being watched. It seemed to her that the shadows around her were getting closer. She quickly gathered up the documents and hurried away. When she returned home, she found that the door of her apartment had been broken into. Things were turned over, and the laptop she was uploading videos to was gone. Sarah felt panic creep over her. She knew she had to act quickly. She went to the local police station to tell them everything. However, the officers, after listening to her story, only nodded and said they would pass on the information. The next day, when Sarah tried to call the editorial office, her phone went dead. The internet also stopped working. She realized that someone had deliberately isolated her. Sarah decided to act on her own. She went to a nearby town to find a safe place to upload her materials. However, on the way, she noticed that she was being followed. Her car suddenly stalled on an empty road. She tried to start the engine, but to no avail. Sarah looked back and saw a black van approaching her. Sarah jumped out of the car in a panic and rushed towards the woods that stretched along the road. Her heart was pounding in her chest, and her legs were barely lifting from fatigue, 
but fear drove her on. The black van stopped and several people got out of it. Their steps were clear and methodical, as if they knew what to do. Find her. Quickly came a voice, confident and devoid of emotion. Sarah ran, trying not to make any noise. The forest was dark and dense, branches scratching her face and hands. She tripped over a tree root and fell, hitting her shoulder on the ground. Pain shot through her, but she immediately got up, realizing that stopping could have cost her her life. She crouched behind the wide trunk, trying to catch her breath. In the distance, voices and the crackling of breaking branches could be heard. They were combing the forest. Sarah took her phone out of her pocket, but the screen was broken back in her apartment, and the battery had long since run out. The hope of calling for help has disappeared. She pressed herself against a tree, trying to calm her breathing so as not to give away her location. The footsteps were getting closer. One of the pursuers was only a few meters away. Sarah froze, her heart pounding so loudly that it seemed you could hear it. The man stopped, looking around. He had a flashlight in his hands, the beam of which darted through the bushes and tree trunks. Sarah knew that if she moved, they would find her. She waited until the man had passed on, and quietly rising, continued to move through the forest. Her goal was clear, to take another road or find a shelter where she could wait out. A few hours later, exhausted and exhausted, Sarah went out to an old forest hut. It looked abandoned, a sagging fence, a door on one hinge and dirty windows. However, this was her only chance. She went to the door and pushed it open. The hinges creaked, and Sarah quickly slipped inside. The hut was empty. There were old newspapers on the floor, covered with dust, and several cans with unknown contents. Sarah closed the door, found a wooden chair and propped it against the entrance. She then walked around the hut, examining the windows and trying to see if she could use anything to protect herself. There was an old knife on the kitchen table. It was rusty, but it was better than nothing. Sarah took it and sat by the window, trying not to lose her vigilance. It was quiet outside, except for the sound of the wind stirring the branches of the trees. Her tense wait was interrupted by the sound of a branch cracking nearby. She jumped up, clutching the knife tighter. The shadows outside the window were moving. My heart was pounding in my ears again. Someone was nearby. The door shook from a heavy blow. Sarah stepped back, her breathing becoming uneven. The second blow knocked out the chair propping up the door. The door opened a crack, and a hand appeared through the crack, reaching for the lock. Sarah stabbed without hesitation. There was a scream, and the hand disappeared. She didn't wait for them to break in. Sarah ran out the back door, which, fortunately, was unlocked, and rushed back into the woods. Her legs were barely able to support her, but she ran despite the aching pain in her shoulder and exhaustion. A light appeared ahead. It was a road. Sarah ran out onto the asphalt, hoping that there would be at least someone who could help. Headlights appeared in the distance. She started waving her arms, screaming. The car stopped. What happened? The man behind the wheel asked. They are. They're following me. Help. Sarah screamed, choking on the words. The man quickly opened the door, and Sarah jumped in. The car started off, and her pursuers came out of the woods, staying in the shadows. Who are they? What's happening? The driver asked. I'm a journalist. I found something terrible. They're trying to kill me. The man nodded, glancing in the rearview mirror. We're safe. I'll take you to the police now. But Sarah noticed his hand reach for the button on the dashboard. The car was locked. Sarah's heart sank. Why are the doors? She began, but the man abruptly turned off the road and Sarah realized that her escape was an illusion. The car abruptly turned off the main road, rushing along a narrow, grassy dirt road. Sarah sat on pins and needles, feeling panic take hold of her again. The man behind the wheel did not look scared or confused, on the contrary, 
His face expressed cold concentration. You said you were being followed, he began, without taking his eyes off the road. Who is this? I do not know who they are. Sarah was frantically trying to figure out how to escape. They broke into my apartment, then chased me. Do you have a phone? Call the police. The man chuckled, but did not answer. His silence spoke louder than any words. Sarah tried to open the door, but of course it wouldn't budge. She noticed that there was some kind of metal pipe lying on the back seat. Maybe this could be her chance. What are you doing? She continued, trying to gain time. Just calm down, the man said shortly. Sarah didn't wait for him to explain his intentions. She reached back, grabbed the pipe and hit it hard on the back of the man's head. The car jerked to the side, and he cursed and tried to straighten the steering wheel. Sarah hit him again, harder this time. The man screamed, his head fell powerlessly on the steering wheel, and the car flew off the road, getting stuck in the bushes. Sarah jumped out, almost tripping over the rocks. She ran back to the road, looking over her shoulder to make sure the driver wasn't following her. The car was parked with its headlights on, and the man did not move. Her breathing was labored, her legs were weak, but she kept moving. Finally, the road appeared in front of her again. Her clothes were stained with mud, and blood from cuts on her hands was running down her fingers, but Sarah was alive. A light appeared on the road. It was another car. Sarah, with the last of her strength, ran out into the roadway and waved her arms. The car stopped. This time, a middle-aged woman was driving. My God, what's wrong with you? She exclaimed, opening the door. Help me. I'm being followed. Sarah barely spoke. Her voice was trembling. The woman nodded and took out her phone. Sit down, I'll call the police. Sarah got into the passenger seat feeling tears welling up in her eyes. The woman began to dictate the address to the operator, and Sarah looked around, afraid to see familiar figures in the shadows. The car pulled away, but they had not driven far when the woman frowned, looking in the rearview mirror. Who's that? Sarah turned around. There were several people standing on the road, their faces hidden by hoods. They didn't try to follow the car, they just stood there, as if memorizing it. Hurry up, Sarah whispered, clenching her hands into fists. The woman nodded and accelerated. A few minutes later, they entered the village. The streets were illuminated by lanterns. It was much quieter here. The woman stopped at the police station. Run inside, I'll wait, she said. Sarah ran out of the car and rushed to the building. She was met by the officer on duty, who, after listening to her confused story, immediately escorted her to the office. The police captain looked tired, but immediately got down to business. You say that you were being chased. Were you able to describe them? Sarah shook her head. There were several of them. They broke into my house. They had a van. Then, then one of them tried to catch me in the woods. The officer nodded thoughtfully, making notes. We will send patrols to that area. Do you have a place to spend the night? No, I can't go home. They know where I live. The captain looked at her with understanding. We will find you a temporary shelter. Sarah was placed in a small motel room under guard. The policeman left her, promising that in the morning they would continue to sort out the situation. Sarah lay down on the bed, but sleep did not come. Every rustle and sound from the street made her tense up. She didn't know how much longer she could endure this nightmare. At dawn, she was awakened by a knock on the door. It was the captain. We need to talk, he said, holding a folder in his hands. Sarah sat down at the table. We found something, the officer continued. The van you described is registered to a company that was recently involved in a kidnapping case. Sarah went cold. What? You witnessed something more than just a robbery. These people are professionals. We suspect that they are engaged in human trafficking. Sarah felt a cold sweat run down her back. 
They won't stop, right? The captain nodded. We will do everything to protect you, but you need to be extremely careful. Sarah spent several days in a shelter under police protection. All this time, she practically did not leave her room, fearing that the people who were hunting her would still find a way to get there. Patrols cruised around the motel, but the fear did not let her go for a minute. On the fourth day, the police captain came with the news. We've detained several suspects, he said, nodding to Sarah to sit across from him. They testified, and now we have more information. Is that them? Sarah tensed, her voice trembling. The captain looked at her with regret. No, they work for someone. Someone much more serious. Sarah felt the floor slipping away from under her feet. What do you mean? The captain hesitated. These people are part of a much larger network. We don't know exactly what you saw or why they're after you, but we're sure it's connected to something you don't even realize. He handed her a piece of paper. This is a list of the things they were looking for in your house. Is there any of this that is familiar to you? Sarah scanned the list. Nothing brought back memories for her. Nothing, she said softly. The captain nodded. So we need to review your story. By nightfall, Sarah felt even more isolated. The police were on duty at the door, but this did not bring comfort. She heard someone passing by her room, officers talking. Eventually, exhausted, she lay down on the bed and fell into an uneasy sleep. She woke up to a sound that sounded too close. It was the creak of a door. Sarah froze. Her room was dark, but a faint light filtered through the curtains. She could hear someone breathing heavily. Who's here? Her voice was barely audible. There was no response. Something rustled in the darkness. Sarah slowly reached for the bedside lamp, but her hand found nothing. The lamp was gone. Immediately, a strong hand grabbed her wrist. Sarah screamed, but her scream drowned out her voice. Quiet, he said, muffled but menacing. You've scared us enough already. Sarah struggled, trying to pull away, but she was grabbed by the hair and pulled down. She was thrown to the floor, and immediately someone clamped her mouth shut. No one can save you, another voice whispered. The police outside the door didn't seem to hear anything. Sarah was kicking, her heart pounding so hard it seemed like it was about to burst out of her chest. That's enough, the voice boomed. We don't have time for games. She was picked up and dragged through the window. Sarah could barely see her captors in the dark. They moved quickly, in an organized manner. A few minutes later she was in the van. They'll find her, she whispered, her voice trembling. They won't be looking for you anymore, the man replied shortly, closing the door. The van took off. Sarah tried to remember exactly where the officers were. But less than a minute later, a sharp metallic sound rang out in front of her. The door of the van opened and the light hit her in the eyes. For a moment, she thought she had been saved. But it was the captain. As I said, no one will save you, he said calmly. Sarah gasped in horror, realizing that all this time her protector had been part of the same network. The van sped off into the night, leaving the motel behind. Sarah knew that her fate was sealed.